Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Our reading this morning is taken from the book of Psalms, reading Psalm 46. <clears throat> I am reading from the Good News Bible. <clears throat> God is our shelter and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. So we will not be afraid, even if the earth is shaken and mountains fall into the ocean depths, even if the seas roar and rage and the, the hills are shaken by the violence. There is a river that brings joy to the city of God, to the sacred house of the Most High. God is in that city and it will never be destroyed. At early dawn he will come to its aid. Nations are terrified, kingdoms are shaken, God thunders and the earth dissolves. The Lord Almighty is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge. Come and see what the Lord has done, see what amazing things he has done on earth. He stops wars all over the world, he breaks bows. He destroys spears and sets shields on fire. Stop fighting, he says, and know that I am God, supreme among the nations, supreme over the world. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our strength and refuge. It's to... Uh wander around and find out what's the worst thing that has happened to you. But before we do that, anybody, that tune we just sang, anybody know what was, what was called? Pete says it's the Dam Busters. Dam Busters March. That's well done, Phil. You can have 10% off your offering this morning. <laughs> 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 right, now, uh, what's the worst thing that has happened to you? So uh, we'll start off with you, James. Um, um, I have Crohn's disease. <clears throat> which is a, a pretty well interesting disease. Um, it's a chronic disease. I'll have it for the rest of my life. I've had it for quite some time. But uh, the episode which I draw to attention to is the um, something happened to me 20 years ago or so. Um, I went in for an operation on Monday to have something fixed. And I had another operation on Tuesday and then Wednesday and again on Friday. Um, I had septic semia. And my... Um, wound was continued to be opened and it was pretty messy. Um, but the other time was when I was in intensive care. Now, some of you will remember the Michelin ad, okay, with the, well, that's what I looked like. Of course, I was in intensive care, I was completely knocked out. But uh, it was at that time when my sister, who, you know how families are very hard to witness with? Well, it was only when I was completely knocked out, unable to say anything, that God used me as a great witness towards him. So catastrophe, yes, well, as they say, you never waste a good catastrophe. Okay. Of course, that's the thing this morning, coping with uh, catastrophe. <laughs> Mervis, what about you? What's the, what? Well, I'd have to say last year, you know, having um, a diagnosis of um, common bile duct, um, cancer, but I'd had three lots of surgeries, but the third surgery... Um, which was a nine-hour surgery, and Ooh. I've always been very independent, fiercely independent. So I suppose the helplessness of being wired up and in intensive care and high um, stuff, so that was really... And then four months of chemotherapy. Um, but I suppose I'd have to agree with James. You know, even now I'm supporting people who are having digestive issues because that will be a, an ongoing thing for me. And, uh, and I've got a, a very dear friend who was very supportive for me who's got pancreatic cancer. Mm. And I'm meeting with her and trying to be supportive in that, and, yeah. to, and which she finds uplifting being with me because you understand. So God is using already my, um, I call it my shark attack. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, it, well, the experience of that um, to hopefully support others. So okay. that's the good side of it. But, yeah, it was, um, you know, being well all my life, really, been fortunate. And seeing my kids crumble with that. And when I don't say crumble, they were great. But my daughter in particular, you know, trying to support them and get through it. But um, You obviously did, yeah. Was God, with God's help, you know. Good, so, yeah. good. OK, anybody else want to share? What's the worst thing that's happened to you? Judy, 
We'll t try you out. We'll get that shock look off your face. Marcus. Oh, maybe I can add to it later. Right? Oh, I can't think of something. Straight off? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I don't know. Would, would, would have been hard. Um, would have been hard seeing your mum go into care. Oh, so yes, yeah. That that's current, isn't it? Yeah, just the change in her, and yeah, it feels like I've lost mum already. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. All right. Now we'll come over to you, Ellen. I would think that losing to. To Collingwood in a grand final would be probably the worst okay. thing that I, I could ever imagine. Especially but, Collingwood. <laughs> especially, uh, yeah. Um, I, th I think that uh, something serious happening to your children, you know, by way of suffering and that. And uh, I had my three sons. We only got three sons. Each of them go down in horrendous ways in uh, the last 12 months, and uh, that was pretty hard to take. All right. But anyhow, we uh, offered it all up to God, and uh, things are sort of looking a little bit better. Good. Good. Mark, you're, you're the last one. Um, I'm a bit like Judy. I, I, uh, I actually don't think anything bad has happened to me. Um, uh, but at the time, uh, I thought there was many things that were really bad that were happening to me. But uh, when you look back on those times, you, look, you, you realise that that was God just teaching you how to cope with the next thing that was probably going to happen. So that's my view of, of things. I think they're, they're all just transitory and you, and you learn a lot from them along the way. Yeah, OK. Well, well shared. Uh, you do. And this is what we're going to be pointing out, coping with catastrophe. Uh, the story I'm going to tell about the worst thing that happened to me uh, is partially true. You will work out what's true and what's not. But um, about three years ago, I had a, a narrowing of the valves and uh, they said to me, uh, uh, even though I was symptom free, I had to have a valve replacement. And uh, they go up through the groin and you know, rather than rip the chest open and, uh, and they say, you, you'll be out three or four days, you'll be running marathons a week after and all that time. Oh, that'll be good. Anyhow, it so turned out that um, when I went through this op, uh, a little bit of my heart or something floated up to the brain and I had a, a stroke. And that, that's pretty bad because I, I lost the use of my right hand and I also um, couldn't speak properly. Marge came in one day and said, you've had a stroke. Yeah, well, 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 And uh, I lost the ability to talk. Now, that, for a guy who all he can do is talk, uh, that's pretty bad. So uh, as far as the hand's concerned, I got out uh, my stuff I used to play as a teenager and worked at that and still working on it and uh, it's coming good. Uh, the speech thing was a real worry. I went to a speech therapist and uh, she told me that I had to do exercises um, and uh, stand in front of the mirror and go da 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 ba 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 da 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 ba ba I couldn't be bothered doing that so I went down to the local charismatic church where they do that all the time. <laughs> but, the, the, other thing, the other thing that I did was to take the late, late Oscar, the Wonder Dog, uh, around the block and uh, I practiced preaching. I practiced preaching sermons while I was walking because uh, Crib Point's a fairly uh, semi-rural area. And uh, it, was, it was tremendous actually, the, the, the improvement. Uh, Oscar, the Wonder Dog, uh, he became a Christian because of the preaching. <laughs> and, uh, unfortunately, there were 12 calls to AAA, but uh, apart from that, it, it all worked. And when I think of that, uh, I, I think the worst thing that happened, but then you compare, the, you compare our stories to what we're seeing happening around the world, uh, in Turkey and uh, Ukraine and things like that, and our issues are absolutely minor compared to the world problems that are happening right now. But, but... When you're going through that catastrophe, when you're going through it personally, what happens is your world shrinks and you start to think only of yourself. Nothing wrong with that. I certainly went through that process and I was just concerned about myself. In this room, we've got all types of things that have gone wrong. We've heard about cancer, we've had accidents, we've had relationships issues. Some of you have been in a church split somewhere in the world. And there are things that actually cause the bottom to drop out of our world and we wonder how we're going to cope. 
I remember visiting a relatively young woman in a in hospital in Wollongong, and she was about to have a mastectomy, uh, which for a relatively young woman would be a, a, a tragedy within itself. And I asked her how she was feeling. She said, I'm nervous and I'm confident. What are you nervous about? Well, she talked about the disfigurement. She talked about the pain that follows the operation, whether they'll get it, all the cancer and all that type of thing. What are you confident about? She said, when those little green men come and wheel me away into the operating room, I'm confident that God will be there. And I'll walk through this, she said, with God's presence. And that was actually a lot of, a lot of sense because research has shown if you're facing a catastrophe like cancer or something like that, if you take, face it realistically, you do much better. And as far as my uh, little heart operation was concerned, I thought it would be a breeze. And I struggled because when I discovered it wasn't going to be a breeze after all. Now, how can we cope with a catastrophe, a personal catastrophe? Have we got that confidence? Now, since the age of 25, you all have, and me as well, have been declining in strength. And actually, as you get older, it, uh, it increases. Have we got the confidence to cope with declining strength and the fact that our world will be bitter, uh, uh, become worse? When we're bitter and twisted over some hurt that has happened, will, do we have the confidence that love will prevail? Do we cope with pressure? And when the pressure comes, will we be able to sustain our faith in God? Now, what we're talking about is the fact that we all suffer. And those of you who are feeling very smug and saying, I've never suffered in my life, tomorrow might be different. We'll catch up with you. Will we cope? And the question is, as we think about the psalm we've just heard this morning and then we're saying, will we cope with God? Now, question I raised a couple of weeks ago, is God our insurance policy? Will God actually protect us from the knocks and bruises that happen to other people? And you heard me say emphatically, no. We are subject to the rest of the, what the rest of the world is going to suffer. And uh, our homes won't be protected if there's a fire. Our homes won't be protected if there's a flood and so on. I guess as Christians we're less likely to suffer violence in the home. We're less likely to be alcoholics. We're less likely to be shot. You've got to live in the northern suburbs and western suburbs for that to happen. Uh, and when we think about that, there are some things that we're protected. They did some research and discovered Seventh-day Adventist people uh, actually live four or five years longer than the women do. And that is because of lifestyle issues. We, but we cannot claim the protection of God in that way. We are as vulnerable as everybody else. And it's interesting. When you look at the New Testament and you look at the lives of the, the, the apostles, according to tradition, they all died a violent death, except one. And who was that? John. John, yeah, John was excused from that. Floods and fire, we are not exempt. And the New Testament doesn't actually talk about protection. The New Testament talks to us about the fact that we have to go through some form of suffering. Now, despite that, we are the confident people of God and we have survival skills. Now, when we think of survival skills, do we need God with that? We're discovering in our secular world that more and more people are teaching us about survival. Uh, you go to a seminar uh, and you learn how to cope with uh, uh, cancer, you learn how to cope with addiction, you learn how to cope with divorce, uh, even you have a say, um, group that will help you uh, cope with death when it, when it comes. Can we, we're taught how to survive. And there are groups that teach you how to overcome sensitive, sensitivity and become assertive and not become so depressed. And we're taught, secular, that we are okay. Uh, we are people. We are okay. But for seculars, the secular story is not the whole story. As Christians, we've got something else going for us. In times of trouble, we have God who is there. Now, now I think it was uh, Richie Benoit who used to say when he was commentating on cricket, uh, as the, the sun sets, the lights on the MCG become brighter. 
And that's the story of life. As the sun sets and the world becomes a bit dark during a time of catastrophe, the light of God shines brighter. And it's interesting how we cope with catastrophe. Viktor Frankl, who tells the story of a rabbi who was going through the um, concentration camps during the Second World War, and as he saw his relatives going up in smoke, he said to himself, I cannot believe in a God who would allow this to happen. But Viktor Frankl had a different perspective. As he saw his relatives going up in smoke, he found a greater sense of awareness of God. And that greater sense of awareness of God helped him survive. Now that is the theology of the psalmist. In times of deprivation, God provides. In times of isolation, God is our presence. In times of sadness, he can lift the mood. In times of trouble, he is our refuge and strength. Now the psalmist says, it's great words, God is our refuge and strength. How did he know that? Because he had a sense of history. Now probably in your homes or in your home you used to live in as growing up, there was a passageway. And when you went down that passageway, it was a the passageway opened up to various rooms. And that was a little bit like Israel. Israel was the passageway. And if the Egyptians wanted to fight the Romans and the Romans wanted to fight the Egyptians or the Assyrians wanted to invade or Alexander the Great wanted to come marching through, they'd go through Israel. It was a passageway. And time and time again, there was warfare. There was the exodus, there was the exile, and it went on went time of Maccabees and so on. It was trouble. And because of this sense of history, they knew that God was there. And they knew not to reach for the panic button. Now, think about this room that we're in. Every one of you, most of you, have through, been through a bad time. And what we've heard is that we've all emerged. We are all here. And we're here and we've learned something through the process as we've heard the story, various stories. Hope has been restored. There has been healing. And we've re we might have panicked at the time, but we can say we have been through it before. God is our refuge and strength. Now, what is a refuge? Refuge is a place where you hide, a place where you take time out. And that, that's a good thing. You need that time to recover and to get a sense of perspective. But the psalmist also says God is our refuge and strength. And there comes a time when we need to re-emerge. There comes a time when we need to grapple with life again. There comes a time when we need to address the evil that is besetting us. And we need to be a conqueror, not a victim. You see, God is our refuge and strength and that is a reminder that we will not surrender. Now, think back to your school days and you read the story of Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. And uh, one of the visits that Pip used to make, working out who left him all the money, was to Miss Havisham. Miss Havisham was an old lady who uh, was to be married many years before at 10 past nine, and she got stood up. The bridegroom never arrived. And everything stopped at that point. The clock stopped at 10 past nine. She sat in the, the room where the reception was to be held, and there's a cake before her decaying full of mice and with cobwebs. She surrendered because of catastrophe and she allowed herself to go into decline because of that. We do not surrender. And uh, I, I think of Dunkirk and some of you who have a sense of history. Remember, after that the Germans were about to invade England and Winston Churchill stood up in Parliament and said, uh, we will fight them on the beaches, we'll fight them in the air, we'll fight them in the land, and we will not surrender. And I guess the uh, Slinky uh, uh, in Ukraine is a t t type of Churchill. He's saying much the same type of thing. It is not the will of God to surrender. The will of God is, according to this psalm, for us to pick up the pieces and to move on. Last week we were looking at Psalm 23 and he said this, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Very interesting words. Though I walk through. It's not going to be a permanent lot. 
I'm going to keep moving even though I am in the shadow of death and I will fear no evil. God is our refuge and strength. And paralysis is not appropriate. The psalmist kept moving and so must we. And then the psalmist raises a point that things get pretty bad. Though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, we shall not be moved. Though the mountains shake. Now, the mountains are pretty permanent. Uh, the uh, Israelites thought that uh, God's presence was no more in the mountains because it was always there. And there are things that we see as always there. We'll always be working at the desk. We'll always be teaching in the classroom. We'll always be a nurse. The family will always be around us. And some of these things determine who we are. And they are the mountains of our life. But though the mountains shake, we will not always have those things around us. There comes a time when the doctor might say to us, there's no more we can do for you. Sometimes in work situation, the boss might say we no longer need you. Or the parents who have always been there all our lives are now no longer there. Some of you have been through a situation where your partner leaves and the, the bottom drops out of your world. Or you might have a situation, which I've encountered many Christian families, where the child comes up and says, um, you'll never be having grandkids because I am gay. Though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, we will not fear. Though its waters roar and foam. And the Israelites saw the water, water as a source of evil. They weren't a seed for going nation. And they saw this as a power of evil. Uh, each uh, afternoon, around about half past five, I head into our garage and uh, I've got a gym in there. I've got a, a cross trainer and a treadmill and a bike and things like that. I do weightlifting, you wouldn't think so, but I do. And uh, after that I come in and uh, Marge says to me, I have a TV in there as well, I watch the news while all this is going on. What did you see? Each time I would say exploitation, violence, injustice, dictatorships, and these things, as you watch the news, shake our confidence and hope. Though its waters roar and foam. And what upsets me more than anything, as I look at the war in Ukraine, as I look at the uh, situation with the earthquake in, in Syria and uh, Turkey, and the Syrians wouldn't allow aid to go through at one stage, when I look at that, human life is treated so poorly and so cheaply. That upsets me. Though its waters roar and foam, God's power is greater. Now listen to this verse. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help right early. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear and burns the chariots with fire. And then this great promise in verse 4. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. A river. To the Israelites, that was an image of God's presence. That was an image of God's power. That was an image of God's cleansing. And sometimes we ask why, and there doesn't seem to be any answers. But in the midst of pain and injustice, there is the blessing of God. You see, when we're going through a catastrophe, we ask ourselves, can any good come of this? James shared a story. Mavis shared a story. We heard stories about how good can come out of the sadness of the moment. Now, over the years I've seen realities. I've seen the family that has been divided and when Dad suddenly dies, the family comes together. I've seen separation and divorce and I've been very sad in some of those situations. But I have seen a child's relationship with their father improve after that. I've seen illness cause a change of priorities. Floods bring, sometimes bring communities together. And sometimes there's the discovery that what people thought was concrete was actually plastic. And there's a new awareness of the kingdom of God. That can come. There is a stream who makes, makes glad the city of God. But we're always on the run. We're moving all the time. We fill our days up and sometimes 
When we cope with catastrophe, we're not prepared for it, and we panic. Now, the psalmist has got some very good advice when we're in panic mode. Be still and know that I am God. I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with it. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Be still. I've seen the pressures. I've seen marriages, business, physical and mental illness, family divisions, people overcommitted, people under tremendous pressure. And we need to hear that voice, be still. And Cliff's a great help to us with this. He's sending out Bible readings and it's a, it's a reminder that we need to take time each day just to be still in the presence of God and reflect on what we're reading and how that impacts us. And personally, it helps us see things in perspective. It helps us understand who we are and who God is. See, in times of catastrophe, we feel as if the bottom has dropped out of a world. Now, you know that even that happens, that there is a God. You know that his love is revealed through Jesus Christ, but becomes cerebral. When we're still, it becomes a part of it. And you appreciate that he is a very present help in trouble. Now, whatever you're facing up to, whether it's surgery, financial issues, conflict, family issues, terminal illness, whatever it is, hear this. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Isn't it marvellous to be reminded of that? And isn't it marvellous in communion to be reminded of that? In our Church of Christ tradition, we often talk about, you know, do this in memory of me, and we take our minds back to the cross. The Catholic and Anglican and Lutheran tradition teaches us something else. They teach us when we take communion that Christ actually comes to us. Christ is present. Christ reminds us of who we are and who he is and is a great source of peace in a time of catastrophe. So as we come to take the bread and the cup, do so in memory of Christ, sure, but be aware of his presence. God is our refuge and strength a very present help in trouble. And we'll discover that Christ is here as we take the bread and the cup. Let's pray together. God our Father, each one of us comes in particular needs. And we pray that we might be reminded that you are our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Bless each one of us as we take the bread and cup and remind us that Christ is here. Christ leads the way, Christ calls us on, Christ comforts and Christ saves. We thank you for this through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You're going to hear some marvellous music while we take communion. Just come, help yourself and take the bread and the cup.